Ugh. Your parents just don't understand you. And your friends are talking crap and causing drama. The city is absolutely overrun with monsters. It's kill or be killed out there. And promise tomorrow. You're a teen. And this is the apocalypse. <laughs> Um, I'm Faith Cox, and I'm going to be your moderator today. And with me, in no particular order, because I wrote this before they sat down, is Ricky Lima, Chris Gooch, Jillian Henshaw, and Liz Suburbia, who will now introduce themselves. In no hey. particular order. All right, well, I'll start. Uh, I'm Ricky Lima. I'm from Toronto, Canada, uh, and I'm the writer of Undergrowth. I think that's it. OK. And I'll, I'll be Julian Henshaw for your pleasure today, and this is Space Junk that's just come out about a week and a half ago, and I'm from uh, the UK. I'm Liz Suburbia from Richmond, Virginia. This is my book, Sacred Heart, that came out in 2015. Uh, I'm Chris Gooch, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, and In Utero came out January, by about early 2024. Uh, well, my first question is the obvious. Why teens and why the apocalypse? Who's starting? Ricky? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> you looked at me, so... Oh, jeez. Um, I think <laughs> with teens, there's such a... Um, uh, this, like, need for change and this need for growth that can only happen, I mean, dramatically in, a, in an apocalypse. And so I think that there's that idea that, you know, change happens when things die and things come back. So, I mean, the beginning of my story, everyone dies and then comes back. And I think that that's a perfect metaphor for change and for growing up, you know what I mean? And, and if that happens during an apocalypse, then uh, it's just a little bit more exciting. Nice. Um, this is my fourth book with Top Shelf. And the previous ones I've dealt with um, old age, um, a younger adolescent child, um, a 20-something couple. So the teens was the next thing that I wanted to kind of <laughs> tick off. I don't know where I'm going to go after this, so we shall see. But as Ricky said, the kind of the chaotic state of being a teenager fitted absolutely beautifully with the, the premise being this is on a, on a, a mining planet in a far distance, the planet is being pillaged and raped and they're moving on to the next one. And these teens do not want to go, they do not want to leave, they want to stay. So it's a very much about cementing your identity um, and being true to yourself, which when, as you're a teenager, I think that's something you're struggling with. I know, I, mean, I was a, a terrible, haughty little goth back in the UK <laughs> in the late 90s, and so I kind of tapped into that um, Teen angst, really. Hell yeah. Um, for me, I mean, it's been a while since I wrote this book. I'm turning 40 this year, but I was 25 when I scripted Sacred Heart, and then it, it took me several more years to draw it and then redraw it, um, and it's been a while since it was published. So at the time, I was definitely processing my own high school experience a lot. I was just far enough away from it to be kind of looking in the rear view. Um, and my book deals with a, I guess you could call it a, a, an apocalypse that's sort of religious in nature. Um, I had a very religious upbringing um, of a couple of different religions. And I think all of that and like, you know, the, the social aspect um, and a lot of other um, parts that I hadn't really consciously thought of came out through the book. And honestly, ever since I wrote it, I haven't been dwelling on my, um, on that part of my life as much. I just kind of like got it out through the book. Um, and my hope is to continue it as the characters grow older in real time. There's a beginning of a sequel that I published in 2018 that starts up 10 years later. Um, but you know, life, gets in the way, things are long. So um, I guess I see the teen aspect of it as just a good starting point for a much longer story. Cool. Um, I think for me, the, the teenage stuff was almost like a, a entry point for the, the genre. Like 
the stuff that this is riffing on that I really love was the starting point, and then I built the story and the characters after that, but I knew I wanted to do, like, a monster book set in, like, an abandoned mall. I wanted to reference um, the very first Digimon movie, if anybody's seen that. I love <laughs> yes. it. Yes. Yes, it's fantastic. Um, and then Domu by uh, Otomo, also amazing. So th there was that sort of, like, almost starting as window dressing, but, you know, going into it, teenagers are very... Like, they feel alienated so easily, and it's really fun and almost easy to channel really strong emotions through them. And unlike, you know, I feel like an adult, it takes me a while to change, and it takes me a while to think over things and, and digest it, and then, you know, I'll be like, oh, maybe I was, like, an asshole five years ago and I should fix myself. Teenagers change, like, every six months. So it lends itself to, like, you know... Page one, they're one thing. Page 200, they're another. It's that, like, believable metamorphosis over the, the process of the book. Also, your, the, so the social stuff in your book looked like a lot of fun. Like, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of other stuff as well that looked, like, less fun. But, um, yeah. Well, I, and some of that was stuff I didn't get to do. Uh, so, like, the book was a way to sort of vicariously experience a lot of stuff that I didn't get to experience. But I think that might be relevant a little later on in the conversation. We can expand on that. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yes. Titillating for later. <laughs> um, so, you'll have different sort of apocalyptic scenarios in your book. And they're very creative. And so I wanted to ask, what inspired you to come up with your apocalyptic foil and maybe we start at this end this time oh okay uh, well the world is definitely ending uh, climate change and overfishing and the upcoming environmental apocalypse is you know bearing down on us so there's that um, but also this stuff is really fun and a really good conduit for character arcs and just dumping people into it um, I'll let you guys jump in and add to that um, when I was the age that the characters in my books, in my book are, um, I was reading the Bible pretty obsessively, maybe obsessive compulsively, um, especially the more apocalyptic parts. Um, the book of Revelation kind of filled me with terror, um, but also it was kind of like I kept going back to it the same way you might go back to a favorite horror movie if I had been allowed to watch horror movies at that point. <laughs> it was kind of my favorite horror movie. Um, and then, you know, of course, after I got past that stage in my life, but before I wrote the book, I started actually watching a lot of horror movies because I was able to as a more independent person. And I think they got kind of mushed together um, because they inspired the same feelings when I was taking in stuff to uh, Does it exp kind of expel out as, as influences. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's the word for drawing that sounds better? <laughs> Did you find that it like, like if you kind of watched the horror movie and, and lived and read Revelations, did it like release some of the anxiety about it? I find that with horror movies that afterwards I'm like, I've used up all my horror and now I feel a bit more safe in the world. I think I was just a really anxious uh, young person until I was about 19 years old when my whole viewpoint on religion and spirituality completely changed. Um, I'm thankful to a liberal arts college education <laughs> for that. Um, I think things are a lot healthier for me now as far as, you know, um, interfacing with the spiritual aspect of being a human being and the but the other parts you know um, I had a Catholic dad and an evangelical mom um, and so there was a lot of like the fire and brimstone but also like for all the things that are awful about it the Catholic Church really has a lot of aesthetical stuff kind of on lock um, and I grew up with a lot of a lot of that powerful imagery, you know, um, you know, like Hieronymus Bosch paintings, that kind of that kind of thing, and it all kind of, you know, that kind of stuff sort of came together with the stuff I was, um, you know, that history with stuff came together with the stuff I was consuming at the same time that I started writing this, which was with a lot of comic books, a lot of punk bands, a lot of horror movies, 
um, that kind of thing. Could you repeat the question? I yes. got lost with Horonus Bosch. I was just kind of no, <laughs> it's, it's hard sometimes to listen and get like so invested in what people are saying yeah, and then yeah. like remember you have to prepare your own answer. So yeah. I'm with you. I froze. Um, so in your book, you have like an end of world situation. Yeah. How did you come up with that? What inspired you? Um, I think it was the, all the characters within the book, there are two teenage protagonists there's also an emotional support chicken nice. in there That's my as well. Character, I have to say. I love the chicken. <laughs> so, and there's a couple of older, um, middle-aged individuals as well. But everyone's dealing with their own apocalypse, their own crisis, and it's the. I wanted to kind of deal, look at how they get past that scar tissue moment in their lives, how they kind of m try and move forward, um, and each each person's a little. Drama, own little apocalypse, is, um, is is being played out in a wider apocalypse, which is the the planet is being torn apart. But I was really keen to focus in on each person's how they move past that moment of turmoil. So that that's what kind of and that one of the girls, Faith, she has a, a piece of space junk bolted to her head, and um, I was very interested in the memories of objects. Do, does this microphone have a memory of various people who've spoken into it over the, you know, over the SPX? So I was, I was kind of wanting to look into memory as well and how that, how that is tied into us getting past moments. That's a that fascinating sense. concept. Like, yeah. I'm going to have to think about that later. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, right? Like if we could somehow get the memories out of this microphone, we could relive that stuff. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I think for undergrowth, um, every character in every situation deals with uh, trauma. And so the end of the world apocalypse idea came from what a society would look like if it was dealing with the trauma of the world dying. Um, and so, you know, I think that that the whole kind of aspect of the nature behind it all, I think relates to uh, a world that's dying and the hope that they, they would want, you know, nature to come back. Um, so I think, yeah, like, it's kind of like what the world would look like if society as a whole was featuring or was going through trauma and what that would look like. Um, yeah, I think that's a major theme in the book, yeah. Well, and very speaking, relevant to right now. <laughs> I know, right? I was going to say, speaking of society as a whole going through trauma, <laughs> with three of you writing books, like, during pandemic or in, like, a post-pandemic world, do you feel like that sort of collective trauma and like the world is ending feeling played into your writing process at all? Were you inspired by it? I think it's, I think it's gonna bleed in. I think you're gonna be through osmosis or something, you're gonna be taking in what's happening and I think we all want to reflect what we see happening. Some, some stories are more upfront about how they're going to do that, but I think I've only, unfortunately I haven't read your book but um, the other two, there's a, there's a certain commentary, I would say, taking place there, subtly. So, I had written the majority, or I'd written the first draft of mine pre-COVID and then did the majority of the rewriting during it. And that was kind of a process of going back in. I probably had a very different experience from the rest of you guys because I was in Australia, in Melbourne, and in you know one way we had it, really very easy, but we also had the longest lockdown of anybody in the world, so we were in our houses, you know, we had like 1.5 kilometer radius, that's how far you could go for months and months and months across all of 2020. So, yeah, kind of incorporating that isolation in the illustrations, and then if I'd drawn this like a year before, like there wouldn't be any proper PPE representation. Like I would have, <laughs> right. like, but masks and all that stuff are all through it now on purpose, mm -hmm. like on purpose. And I, yeah, I think it would look silly if I'd done it just before COVID. I think people would read it and be like, this doesn't feel like the thing that we lived through. So, so luckily for me, COVID. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because there's a large like contamination aspect of yours that really does kind of have that feeling of like, we don't know what this is, but it's dangerous and it's potentially everywhere. Uh, yes. You predicted COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Thanks, my fault. Yeah. Thanks, Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, for undergrowth, it, there was like so much that was going on. Um, so I wrote it just before 2020. 
Um, and during that time, for myself personally, like, I wasn't having a great time. Like, you, you know, you don't want to die, but you actually don't want to just go through it anymore. But so it's one of those things where that really permeates the book as well. And it's like the idea that, you know, how, how do these people survive when maybe they don't want to? Um, but then when the artist, uh, Daniele, he's from Italy and he was working throughout the whole pandemic on it. Um, and then I, th I feel like that isolation really appears in, in his work. Um, he does, he did it all black and white. Um, and then we had our, our colorist, she's from the Ukraine. And when, um, when the invasion happened, it, she was working through the whole thing and it was, it was intense. I was like, are you sure you're going to work through this? And you know, I mean, she was like, yeah, I'll continue working. And it, it's weird how it becomes like mundane, normal life. You know what I mean? And I mean, that's not my story to tell. She'll have to tell it herself. But um, just being on the peripheral and seeing that, and I was like, how are you still working? And she, she was. And I think that that kind of permeates throughout the book as well, because you see this like, it, I, at the end of the book, everything is on fire. And for me, I was like, okay, well, it would look very dark, but it looks very bright in the, in the book. And I don't, I don't know where that came from. I mean, she would have to talk about that, but I feel like you know her experience going through that might influence how that looks. Uh, I'd have to talk to her about that. But, mm -hmm. No, that's yeah. fascinating. It was truly like an international collaboration oh, yeah. at a time when like you couldn't get to people. Right, yeah, God bless the internet, man. Like, <laughs> Yeah, well, and speaking of, so like a running theme throughout all of these books is searching for connection and like characters going through things and finding each other. Like Chris, in your book, your character bonds with a literal monster. Um, so do you think that's more like a, the nature of the apocalypse or the nature of like teens who want to see themselves in others? I'd say that, yeah, almost like, you know, you're talking about it's the end of the world, but you still have to go to work. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's the same with these teenagers and probably these poor kids that went through high school in COVID. Like, it's the end of the world, but you're still, like, an anxious teen. Like, mm -hmm. you still don't really know who you are and you're deeply insecure. And even though there's, like, the world might be crumbling around you, or in the case of my book, like, there's, you know, monsters and fights and violence and stuff, like, still maybe the most important thing is if this person likes you or, or <laughs> like, you know, some sort of validation you're looking for. Um, my book particularly was based off experiences I had as a teenage, no, as a, what do you call it, like 11 or 10, where a my mum didn't, a tween? Okay, yeah. it's a tween. My mum didn't trust me to be home alone when she went off to work, so I get dumped in these extended holiday programs, but I'd be like way too old and it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, so that's where that like embarrassment and alienation comes through from that book. But that's a digression. So please, Liz. Oh, um, I mean, a big part of what I was introduced to as a teenager, um, you know, I went to high school with um, my, my dear friend cartoonist, Karen Chap, who gave me my very first zine and my very first mixtape. And through that, I was introduced to DIY culture, um, you know, which is a big part of like punk culture, um, which is a big influence on my book. And I think that spirit is very alive in teenagers and kind of brings them together because it's it is something that's collaborative. It is something that takes a lot of a lot of work, um, a lot of kind of just ground up, teens organizing things together, teens communicating with each other to share things together. Um, and without, I guess, spoiling what's going on in my book too much, in case anybody hasn't read it and wants to, um, I really feel like that's still some of the, the parts of the story that's most vital for me, especially thinking about both where I think we as a society are headed, where as our um, as the social safety net kind of continues to collapse, how we need to um, build systems of support amongst each other, um, you know, like in Richmond, um, Virginia, I've done a lot of work with like food not bombs, um, or like there's prisoner support, all kinds of stuff where it's, you know, you don't get permission from anybody with like state or government level power to do it. You just reach out to each other and cover each other's needs to the best of your ability. And a lot of the, that's kind of how the society is functioning in this, in this book. Um, and my hope is, is to really explore that more and the effect that that has 
on the characters who live beyond the book in future volumes, because to me, that's one of the most interesting things to be talking about right now. For me, the, um, the connection between the two characters, Hoshi and Faith, um, is very important in the sense that they are kind of mandated to go to therapy and discuss how they're feeling about the fact that the whole, co the whole society is about to move on to the next mining planet and then tear that to bit and move on to the next one. So <laughs> the two of them are beginning to drift away from everybody else, as you can do as a teenager. And then you begin to kind of, to use a space metaphor, you begin orbiting everybody else. You're not in contact with these people. You're yeah, you're intended. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and they, they're also then harboring the secret that they want to stay on the planet. They want nothing to do with traveling with everybody else. So they, they're kind of isolating themselves and they've got a dirty little secret. It's, it's, it was a, and then they find each other and they kind of fall in love. There's not really a relationship there, but it, it is that sense that when you do find someone, especially at that age, they become your world. Everything, it, everyone else just disappears into the background. And this is what they're hoping everybody does anyway. So their connection is, is really pure and it, and it will manifest itself with everybody else just leaving them the hell alone by moving on to another planet. <laughs> um, Julie, I'm actually, before I talk, I'm curious about that connection with the, uh, the bully character at the end. Do you feel like they have a positive connection or, or not? So, sorry, the bully character is a positive? Or th th do you feel like that connection, um, like how do you feel about their connection? Because they seem to be very close kind of by the end. Yeah, by the end, at no point during the story do they kiss I don't even I don't even, <laughs> even hold hands or anything um, but I think there's a there's, there's a there's a bond there's a kind of a brothership or, or whatever you want to call it they they've beaten everybody mm. and uh, whatever happens after the final pages it's kind of up to you but they just got to that point and they they now have the freedom to express themselves completely and the bully is incinerated <laughs> yeah um, yeah, I think uh, for me, um, I feel like Undergrowth is the more um, hardcore sci-fi book uh, versus everyone else. So I had a little bit of freedom in order in that world to kind of create connections in a different way. Um, there's like a character who lives inside of another character. And um, so I feel like that, that kind of connection is looking at different ways. Um, even though you've lost someone, maybe they're still with you. And, both the literal and the figurative sense. Um, and I think that kind of exists within um, the, the idea of the society featuring, or the society living under trauma, and you're looking for those connections, and sometimes those connections don't exist outside of you, sometimes it's exclusively inside of you. Um, and I think that that is very, you know, something that you need to figure out as, as a teenager, I, I guess. It's, if you're not getting those connections from people around you, I mean, maybe you have to look inside yourself and figure out those connections, right? Yeah, and especially like your book, you had four characters who were super close at the beginning, and right. you know, the inciting incident changes how their relationships function, which feels very relatable to teenagers. You know, like you go to high school and your best friend right. is no longer your best friend yeah. for whatever reason, and I don't know. I just found that fascinating that like whereas some of the other characters started out alone. Yours were together and then had to reestablish wow. how they felt about each other. I didn't even think about that. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> <a> close read. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Um, I've been doing these questions out of order, so pardon me. And I feel like we've sort of touched on a lot of them because you're getting really, you all are giving really answers filled with a lot of depth, and I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, like apocalyptic stories tend to heighten the stakes of any situation, obviously. Characters are on the literal edge. How did you use this to your advantage, like in your particular story? Ooh, geez. Oh, man. For some boomerang. <laughs> you guys just dropped out on it. Um, ooh. I think for me, it was it, it, the, the apocalypse and that idea of being on the edge just kind of gave it um, this kind of urgency that in literature you need, like, you know, they could just be sitting around just talking about their feelings and then you'd be like, all right, this is boring. So like when I started the book, I wanted to make pretty much an exclusively, you know, 
Balls to the Walls action book. But then as I was going through it, I was like, well, okay, why are they doing this? You know, like, what is the reason behind it? And then all of a sudden I was like, well, the robots don't matter anymore. You know what I mean? And they, they became like metaphors for everything else. Um, so I lost the train of thought. The question was, oh, the... Yeah, like how did you use On the, edge. the scenario yes. that they're in to further your story? And also, yeah. while we're talking about the mechs, the organic mech idea is so cool oh, and visually you. unique, and I really loved it. Yeah, I mean, shout out to the artist. He really put it together. And I mean, I gave him some, I was like, oh, maybe it'd be cool if it was a giant redwood. And he like drew a really cool redwood. And I was like, yeah, there I, you like, go. Somehow had a little bit of like a Samurai Jack feel in a way yes. that I loved. Oh, man, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and so I, I feel like, you know, putting that urgency within it um, just kind of propelled the story. Um, so just in terms of general interest, I feel like having that you know threat always imminent was really important. Uh, and then exploring the emotions while that was happening is what gave it the you know the girth, I think. you know what I mean? So the action gave it the the, the frame and then the emotions gave it the, the booty. Yeah. And for people that haven't been able to read the book yet, it's a wonderful book. Um, there are these space invaders who yeah. are destroying the environment in, in a very general sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the kids die and they're brought back to life in giant organic mechs. So. It's very cool. I recommend it. Thank you. Uh, I think I use kind of two devices really t to kind of move the story forward. I borrowed from my previous book, which was set against the backdrop of an election. So throughout the book, you had a a countdown to the election day. And I like that kind of ticking happening in the background. So I reuse that in Space Junk. There is a literal countdown for people. You're assigned a shuttle, and then you will leave the planet. So there is, there is that happening. And also, because people had left the planet, there was a thinning out of the population. And I think that I bet it benefited me in a number of ways. A, less people to draw is just so much better. <laughs> it's just when you look at a bit in your script, if you script yourself or whatever, and you just think, and then you've got a crowd scene, you think, oh, I do <laughs> not want to do a crowd scene. So to, to benefit myself and help myself, I thinned out the population, and that was a major plus, really. Hey, artistic decision, full yeah. intent. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Super works. <laughs> Um, like I said, making this book, I don't think I was really conscious of it this way when I started it. I just wanted to make a comic, and this was the story that came to me. But looking back on that part of my life now from where I am now, it was very clearly like a therapeutic exercise and a thought exercise. You know, like I, I mentioned earlier that like I sort of exercised a lot of my you know, the teenage stuff that I was still hanging on to by making the book and got past it and like, you know, was able to continue with my adulthood after finishing the book um, in, a, in a more fulfilling way. But looking back now, it's obvious that without being fully conscious of it, um, the scenario in the book was really a thought exercise for my, you know, early to mid 20s self of like, you know, this belief that I hadn't quite articulated to myself that I would have needed, you know, all the, the social and familial structures as I knew them around my life to collapse in order to have what I would consider a normal social and sexual development as a teenager. Um, and I think that's where, the apocalyptic stuff really comes in because from a certain mindset, I think for a lot of people, the fantasy of an apocalypse is really freeing. I mean, when, when COVID started, I don't know how many of you were furloughed or laid off from your jobs. Um, I was furloughed from my job for several months, which was kind of a moment of terror, but I stepped outside into my yard on that first day and was like, oh my God, I'm free. I'm free. It's, you know, things, things finally changed. You know, something broke up the monotony, which was a really a mixed feeling, um, which I recognized from the mixed feeling that my characters had in the book that I had written several years previous. Yeah, it's like, 
it's very interesting that you say that because you know in yours you get this creeping feeling that like this is going to break down eventually like they're still doing a lot of normal stuff and you know like doing the football game or like putting on punk shows just they're making things happen but like how sustainable is that and it's maybe that like that's how it feels as like a young 20 something doing it by yourself for the first time for sure a lot of a lot of faking it till you make it <laughs> and pretending like you know, you're performing normalcy instead of actually experiencing normalcy in an authentic way because when is anything ever ever normal? There's always some kind of crisis. There's always somebody somewhere kind of living on the edge of the knife, you know? <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, for me, so in terms of incorporating the scenario of crisis, mine is less explicitly apocalyptic than you guys. I think it's more of a, like a monster big fight as, as somebody comes of age and decides who they want to be. Um, but for me, my book's called In Utero for Context, and it's a, a young girl. She's at a holiday program. She's trapped in this environment of abandoned shopping mall, and she gets stuck between this like long brewing fight between these two big monsters. And she befriends one of them and helps that one fight the other. Um, it's not subtle in the way that like it's incorporated, but... Um, definitely like the theme of like becoming and change and figuring out who you want to be which is you know for about a 12 year old that was kind of one of the first times I made a conscious choice like hey I'd like to be this you know I had the opportunity going from what for me was primary to high school and be like oh I kind of hated half the people I spent time with primary school they were kind of bullies I was like let's let's find better people next time so like it's that first chance to be like oh I want to be like this at this this pivotal point um, and then you know, that's mirrored in the monsters. One of them starts off as a bunch of, like, gross eggs that then merges and changes into this hideous, ugly monster, and the other one is this sort of, like, kind of regal-looking big cat based off those those cats that are just skin. <laughs> um, yes. And, like, that, that monster retells the story of its birth because it was conscious for it. So it's all about, you know, the, the central character as well with these two monsters changing and becoming um, into the people they choose to be. And then the story is called In Utero because, you know, yeah. yeah. Can we talk for a second about the, like, generational themes in your book and, like, the mothers and daughters? I thought that was so interesting and I wanted to pick your brain a little bit. Definitely. Some of that comes from the first draft being submitted and Staros is the guy from Top Shelf I worked with and he was like, I don't understand why this is happening. <laughs> so I had to go back in and um, find, like, yeah... The, the backstory or at least the, the familiar relationships within these characters. Um, and like the, the central character has a sort of a strong relationship with her mother who she resents for not trusting her to be independent. Um, and then she meets this monster whose mother did trust her to be independent, like has a sort of like an inverse relationship. Um, and there's that inflection point where the main character realizes that they're not as smart or as independent as they thought they were, which is, that was my experience as being a child. I thought I was smarter than everybody else and better than the other children, and actually I was just a, you know, dumb shit, so. <laughs> well, to piggyback off that, my next question. Um, teenagers are not known for being the smartest individuals. Um, I have heard their brains are not fully formed yet. Did you ever struggle in writing to like purposefully make your characters make dumb teenage decisions? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> Because I was still making dumb decisions, so it was easy to imagine how the thought process to make dumb decisions worked. <laughs> I still make dumb decisions now. <laughs> Julie? Yeah, I think, yeah, mine also make dumb decisions, but they make their dumb decisions out of, it's bravado and arrogance, I think, and I think a lot of teenagers have a bit of, um, which is fun being a teenager when you're just that slightly cocky, you're rebelling against your parents, you've got a bit of swagger about you. And you're almost, I think somewhere you know you are making daft decisions, but you get a free pass with it. And you, you, that's what you're meant to be doing. You're meant to be pushing and exploring. And I think with these two characters within the book, it was fun to push them around and... Um, have them trip and fall their way to the end of the story, really, without some, often not really being in full control. And I quite like that. And I felt that as a teenager as well. I was just kind of oscillating wildly between one stupid decision and another. 
Yeah, because there's even like a moment in your book where a character has like made an effort for a positive change, and then they're just like, "No, no, thank you. I'm going to choose violence." Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the wee fellow Otis, he he does have um, yeah, he has a very violent streak in him, and he he is trying to better himself, and every time that's why he's got this emotional support chicken, and every time someone pisses him off and he doesn't beat the living shit out of them, he would draw an X on his arm. And he's covered in all these X's where he's just, it's just a reminder, a, a motive to push himself and make himself better. So he's, um, yeah, he's a messed up wee kid. He really is. Oh, and that's like so <laughs> dramatic in the teen sense too. Like, oh, I'm so edgy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's doing it with a biro. It's just, there's nothing that edgy about it, but it's rather <laughs> sweet and endearing really. Mm-hmm. But it feels edgy, you know? Yeah. You would shop at Hot Topic if they had one. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel like um, when we talk about, like, a stupid decision, it's almost in hindsight it's a stupid decision. Like, at the time, they're not like, yeah, this is dumb. I'm going to do it anyways. And so, like, a lot of things in in undergrowth are maybe impulsive and in retrospect are a stupid decision. Um, But in terms of in the moment, at the time, they're like, this perfectly. And I feel like even the audience might be like, yeah, okay, this makes sense. Like, I feel like uh, the book does a good enough um, job of explaining why they're going to make this stupid decision that you're like, yeah, you know what? Do that stupid decision. Let's see how that goes out. You know what I mean? So, um, like, when the one character goes up the mountain and it's, you know, her kind of expressing um, her freedom, and, you know, at the end of the day, you're like, yeah, it's a pretty dumb decision. But at the same time, you're like, I get it. I understand. Yeah, well, I feel like a lot of the experience of being a teen is like feeling like you're in control and feeling really good, and then getting just that dose of perspective and being like, oh, never mind, um, <laughs> was not what I thought it was. So, look at you. Um, I think we'll do like one last question before we go to audience questions. And just for fun, do you think you would survive your own book? Oh, God, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'd be like the character, no. No, I don't, I don't have those skills. I spend my time drawing instead. Because <laughs> uh, I feel like your character had to be so open to just be like, monster, I'm in creepy basement, take me there. <laughs> oh, no, I'd be like, I'm scared, take me home. All right. I mean, I'd give myself about a 50-50 chance. Um, I think people who read the book tend to assume that the character who's on the cover is the character that is based on me. Um, which isn't entirely true, although there's a, there's a lot of me in her, but I'd say that there's just as much, if not more, of me in her best friend character. Um, but aside from them, there's also another so- unnamed background character who you see occasionally who is supposed to represent my teenage self, and maybe it's a little indicative of... Um, the disdain that my 25-year-old self had for my teenage self, the way that that character is depicted. But in the 10 years later flash forward, that character is still alive. So I guess that answers the question. I certainly don't think I'd survive my own story. I think I'd be one of those characters who die in the first 10 minutes of a horror film or something. (laughs) I I would, in this book... I would eat some horrifically out of date hummus or something and <laughs> and die from food poisoning. And it, yeah, there's not a hope in hell I'd survive. Yeah, I mean, your setting is a little bit grim because we're seeing like the end of the migration. So I'm so mm. curious what it looked like in the height. You know, was it still kind of just like you're in a strip mining town or was it actually beautiful? No, it'd be a strip mining town, and it would be it would be the last bacchanalian days of Rome as everyone moves out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why they kind of want to stay because they've just seen the worst of people, yeah. and they're just like, okay, you you go and do that, we'll stay here and eat hummus. <laughs> I think um, I I don't think I would survive, but I think I would still want to live in this world and get like a giant organic mech. I think that'd be really sweet. Um, especially like the really tall one because then you could see everything. I think that'd be really awesome. Um, so I, I don't think it would matter if I died or not because I'd be like, oh, just come back to life. I mean, that's what happens in the beginning of the book. So I'd like to live here. Yeah. What if you were like not one of the chosen ones and you were just there? Son of a, uh, <laughs> well, then you, you, you could planet. see it happen. And you're like, look at that. That's so cool. So Like those damn kids. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you guys. Um, would anybody in the audience like to 
posit a question to these lovely minds and authors in front of us? Um, I was just wondering, like, what is your process when creating a story? Like, I, I try to sit down and script, and then it just feels like it all gets all tangled up, and yeah. I have to take a step back and come back to it. Do y'all have any specific processes that, like, help you? I mean, I just write, you know, as, as each, it starts, it's, the book is for me is kind of a patchwork of scenes, you know, like just like something that would only take a few pages, like like a short comic. But and I guess it started in my mind as a bunch of short comics, but they all had kind of the same characters in them. So when I tried to synthesize it into more of a of a novel, um, which I don't know that I recommend. I think it, it's ultimately better to have a bunch of loosely related vignettes and let them form a story when you collect them instead of to really trying to like bang out a graphic novel. Um, making and finishing this book really took a lot out of me and my creative process has never been the same since as evidence that I have never created another 300 page book <laughs> since. But um, just like, once you have like a couple of set pieces or big thematic or emotional moments, um, you know, you put them in the right order and then you come up with connective tissue that, you know, makes sense to put them together. And then you just, you walk away from it for a few days and you come back and you, you know, you go over it to make sure that it doesn't sound like bullshit, you know? <laughs> you just make sure that it, that it works together and trust your own instincts that, um, that it doesn't sound too artificial. I'd really recommend, if you wanted to start with like a script, and that's, that's how I do most of mine, the first draft is always looks like a screenplay, definitely get to the end, finish it before you start drawing or thumbnailing even, like there's nothing worse than being like, like 50 pages in or 200 pages in being like, I don't know how to finish this or <laughs> now I should have gone back and changed everything previously. I also have a recommendation for a book that I kind of love and hate and I can't remember the name of it, but it's, uh, it's How to Write Manga by the guy that did Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. So easy to Google. Okay. And what I love about that book is that like one page I'll read it and I'll be like, ah, oh, this is great advice. And the next page I'll be like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> And like it's not it's not just like a, here's how you do it it's just it's his opinion and his opinion is so strong that like reading it it immediately crystallizes mine um, and he's got some like interesting exercises and stuff in that so I, I definitely recommend checking that book out. Um, you guys recommendations for starting a graphic novel, getting through to the end. I think for me, as I've this is now my eighth seventh eighth graphic novel, wow. and the process is kind of change and fluctuated as I move forward. I mean, I started out a bit like you were saying, I started out and would just start drawing. Mm. And that's never a good thing. Stuff. <laughs> you, you just end up, you lose focus, you, you trip up on the way, and also you just run out of motivation and steam. Yeah. So now I, I start out with a, I usually start with kind of mood boards or something. I know where I'm wanting to go and this I wanted kind of landscapes with great pieces of um, space junk and machinery kind of carving their way across the landscape, leaving big furrows. And I knew that's where I, that's an image that I loved and wanted to represent. And then for this, I would then lay down and just listen to kind of brown noise or ambient music. And I would just switch off my brain and things would suggest themselves. I'd write them down and it was just a process of for slowly moving forward, inch by inch, and forming the story, and then approaching Chris Staros, a good editor, who would rightly say, yeah, that's not working. Because <laughs> he rejected this book twice, I think, before he accepted it. And all his reasons were absolutely perfect and valid and made the story stronger for it. And I think, yeah, if you've got someone near you, if you haven't, don't know an editor or whatever, that you can trust, I think that's very, very important. I had another thing that really helped me at the start, which is if it's like you're going from, you I mean you, you do 10, 15 page things to start with, eight page, that's always easier. But if you're gonna make a big jump to a, a graphic novel, I would say your core story or your script, make it like two thirds of what you want the actual book mm. to be, like make it an 80 page story, because when you start to thumbnail it and change it, it'll, it'll get bigger. And if you're trying to cram some epic 
story idea you have into that. It's, it's just going to become unwieldy. And definitely, like, you have to finish the long projects that you start or else you'll get stuck in that, like, get 50% of the way through, bin it, get 50%, bin it. Like, even if you never show it to anybody, I, I, I've always, like, tried to get to the end of the script at the very least before being, like, they hate it because then you can decide with fresh eyes at the, you know, in a month's time or a year's time. Um, I, for me, I'm a little bit different because I'm just the writer. I'm not like a cartoonist like everyone else. So it's my process. Um, I just kind of outline the whole thing um, very loosely, like this happens, this happens, this happens, and then I know the ending. Uh, and then from there, as I'm writing the script, uh, I'm able to explore those areas and uh, meander around to get to those points. And I think that keeps it very exciting for me because now I'm discovering the story as I'm going. Um, my process is pretty chaotic. Sometimes I'll just like throw things at the wall and be like, yeah, okay, like number generators and stuff. And it's like, I don't know. But uh, but for me, that that's what keeps it exciting, right? Like I used to do improv, improv theater and it's like that, you're just taking whatever gets thrown at you and then moving from there, right? Um, so, so I think, I'm not sure if you're a cartoonist or just a writer or whatever, but I feel like having um, a solid kind of structure first and then discovering your story as you go, uh, for me, was the most exciting way. And I, f I feel like your audience can pick up on that excitement as you're working on it. And the discovery that you're having, they're also having as well. And what's, what's really great is you could be like really vague about stuff and then your audience is like, oh, brilliant. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> totally. So, so what's... With the relationship with your your artist, yeah, we, is it a bit of a two way street? Will he feed back to you and say this scene isn't working? Well, um, so I'll I'll give him a completed script and then he'll thumbnail it and yeah. we won't talk about it at all. And I will accept whatever. Well, I mean, within reason, but whatever he comes up with, I mean, that's the reason I'm working with him cool. is because he's so, yep. you know, he's the expert. Um, and then I'll actually go back and change my dialogue to fit. What what he's done um, because you know I, visually yeah, I'm just a writer I, I don't quite you know know the visual aspects of it so uh, and then also too like really interesting things can come up sometimes I'll just remove dialogue mm -hmm. be like well you know it's already here like you read those old '60s comics and you're like yeah I know they're in a parking lot as a character's like we're in a parking lot so a lot of that stuff you got to take out um, so it's a very collaborative process and I feel like that that sense of discovery as well. It's like, you know, the artist is developing their visual language throughout the book and I'm developing the, uh, the word language, uh, like the words. <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? And then if everyone has that agency over their own work, uh, it really kind of develops something that's unique and something that's bigger than one person could do, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for going into depth on that. That was like super cool to listen to. Um, oh. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, I saw your hand first. Um, I was curious about how color or the lack thereof plays a part in your story and kind of how you help build the story based off of um, you know, the different values you use. Um, can we pass you this mic real quick? Thanks, guys. Um, I was curious about how color is a oh. part. No, yeah, I don't no. think it's on. No, <laughs> no. One second. I can hear you. Yeah, I, oh. I picked up on that. There we go. Oh, okay. Um, I was curious about how color plays a part in your stories or the lack thereof. Um, and like the lack of color there, not okay. Um, and I was also kind of curious about like if values affected as, at all or anything like that. Um, yeah. So black and white for your book? Mine's yeah, mine's black and white. Oh, sorry, I'm not leaning in. Two color, black and white, full color for you, and yours is like a limited palette, but... It's, yeah, it's limited, it's quite a flat, mm. deliberately so, yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, I pick uh, two tones, because otherwise I get paralyzed by choice, <laughs> and I just, it means I can get it done, and um, it doesn't melt my brain and make me want to give up, basically. Which is not a particularly enthusiastic, like, <laughs> like an inspiring answer, but um, create the creative sandbox that means I can get the project done in time, and then I do it. Uh, the other thing I do is I layer half tones on top of the colors, so that will give me, like, if I have a flat red, um, and then I put half tones on it, I have a 
dark red and a red as well. So it gives a little bit of an extra dimension. Um, yeah, but then you end up doing something really cool with it too, where one is like inner world and outer world. Yeah. Oh yeah, and the other thing, the, the two <laughs> yeah. is that I can use it as a visual cue to um, like uh, cut between sequences really easily and quickly. Um, you know, if it's comic, you don't have all the other um, things that a film has, but if you have one panel is red and then the next panel is blue and it's a change of setting, the brain will be like right yeah. away, I'm there. So I have a lot of scenes in, in this book where it's cutting from one thing to another and so on. Um. I mean, a big part of why mine is completely in black and white is because I don't have a very good sense of color as an artist. I'm a, I'm a very intuitive artist, and I think a lot of that's because I'm, I'm sort of a hobbyist. I'm not a full-time artist, um, and I've just always squeezed my comics in around the rest of my life whenever I could get them done. Um, and color would have been another step. But I mean, also, I really... I, I really leaned into the black and white in this book because, I mean, like a lot of my biggest artistic influences at the time, which were like Love and Rockets and like the art of like Raymond Pettibone, you know, and like the original Night of the Living Dead, you know, I, I was thinking in black and white um, visually a lot at the time. So I was, I was kind of trying to do that kind of thing. Although I think if I was doing it now, I'd probably do it a little bit differently but still in black and white. You got all the punk stuff in there too, like the zines and that early stuff. Mm -hmm. Fits in real well. Yeah. I think with mine, color was very important and I spent a long, long time being paralyzed by my own choices. But I kind of enjoy the battle in that respect. Um, it was also very important for me to kind of, as a mood setting, it's kind of got a twilight, lunar feel to it. I, I worked hard to get that. Um, I'm never going to be photorealistic or anything, but I enjoy playing with tone and shadows. Um, and then I work back into the, the panel by hatching as well, because I find that brings up, the, takes a slight flatness away from it. But it was also something that I had, when I was visualizing the piece, I then began realizing that I'm not seeing in color anymore, I'm seeing in black and white. And because this was to do with memories, I just really wanted to push the color tones um, to also try and jolt my my brain into thinking and dreaming back in color. It's, I still don't. Everything <laughs> black and white. But I was. It's also so. It's a bit of a, a wistful look back at um, when I used to visualize things in color. Maybe it's an age processing thing. I don't know. So I, I really work with color very much on this to reflect that. Yeah. Uh, for Undergrowth, it was originally self-published as black and white, so the artist completely worked in, there wasn't even any grays, it was just black and white. Um, and I feel like that really added to the isolation that some panels feel because um, he, all he was working with was black and white. And then when we brought the colorist in, she was able to infuse that with her own energy and with her own uh, ideas. And I feel like that's, again, like what I was talking about, how everyone brings their own ideas and it really brings it to life. So uh, I don't think... No, there's a flower character that um, the flower actually changes color depending on the character's mood. And that was something like I didn't even think about. It. And then the colorist was like, why don't we try doing something like that? And all of a sudden now there's like a completely new depth to the art that wasn't there before. Um, and that's that's just more ideas that people are bringing in that really reflect that. Um, and like I was saying at the end, how everything is very bright when I thought it would be very dark. And for me, that was something that I had to kind of change my brain and be like, okay, is this working? It is working, all right, let's go with it. You know what I mean? And so I feel like color at that point becomes, um, you know, the extra icing on the cake, you know what I mean? Um, I think we have time for one more very quick question. We have to have rapid fire answers. Yeah. <laughs> um, graphic novel you'd recommend that's not your own and not by somebody who's currently oh, that was good. <laughs> good question. I got Stone Fruit by Leilai. Pick it up at the fanographics table. That was like one I picked up and I had really high expectations and it was like even better than I thought. Beautiful book. Prokaryote Season by Leo Fox from Silver Sprocket. Uh, my good friend, Cren Abel and Sleepy and Nighttime. Um, there's a, oh, damn, what's it? Oh, damn, I forgot what it's called. Oh man. Oh man. 
Jeez. Start from the distraction. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Smoke bomb. Yeah. Look over uh, there. I, I want to say it was... <laughs> shit. I don't remember what it was called. But it was a, it, it's almost like a Sailor Moon thing, uh, but they have fruits instead of moon signs, uh, astrological signs. So one's like a pineapple, one's like a strawberry. Flavor Girls is what it's called. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. It's great. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you guys for your lovely answers and your insights into your process. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. Um, this is the social media where you can find all of these lovely people. And if you're interested, this is a playlist they put together for music to go with the books. Oh, yes. Wow. Yeah, music was a huge part of my teenage years, and it really infused into this book. So. Figured. And thank you for putting the playlist together. Oh, that was yes, a cool thank idea. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Yeah, I told some people about that, and they were like, I love this idea. That's so <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's a really diverse playlist. Like, if you try to listen to it all the way through, you're like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> but. Yeah. Thank cool. you again, everybody. Thank you Your so release. much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you.